<laughs> Hello, it's me, Jim. Middle Earth Shadow of Murder is a game about two men without wives just having a good time. But it's Middle Earth, so those two are Elf Hitler number two because the first spot was already taken, and a white cisgendered man who just wants to reunite with his wife. But the aforementioned elf friend he met on Spiritual Grinder doesn't let him go anywhere until they binge watch Elf History X together. To make up for that overton window of story, we will be killing, enslaving, and outright abusing only orcs and uruks. Now, what's the difference between those two? I don't know. I'm not a Tolkien fan. I'm just a loser who likes the movies and rewatches them every year, each time telling his wife Viggo Mortensen actually broke his fingers in that scene. Also, please don't lose sleep over doing all those horrible things to work. They are not humans and clearly can feel any negative emotions. And even if they could, they deserve it because they attacked first. There will be no section on how to get your hands on this gem. And this is how you start it. Alternatively, you can use another method. And before we start discussing gameplay, I need to have a rant. Shadow of Murder was released in 2014, around the same time as the Batman Arkham series. And everyone, including their mother, was spewing out the same dog shit review, comparing Shadow of Murder to the Arkham series at least once. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. IGN, Arkham. GameSpot, Arkham. Guardian, sure. Polygon, Escapist, glad he got his freedom by the way. Eurogamer, Rock Paper Shotgun, even Total Biscuit did it. God rest his soul. And I'm not a fan of those comparisons because they are stupid. Everyone was on their fucking high horse about how the game heavily borrowed from the Arkham series and a little bit from Assassin's Creed. But what's the point of doing that shit? It makes zero sense to say that without making any observations about what's done differently or better using those systems. No shit Sherlock, games do borrow from each other, so what? Are we going to talk about how you reuse the same shitty comparisons from all the other reviews? Does that add any real insight? It does not. Games in the same genre will share some core systems, because there's no point in reinventing stuff when there's already a good working solution. No one with a AAA budget is going to waste time making a fucking stealth system from scratch. And people like you are the first to bitch about why is it not like that other game? So maybe, just maybe it's time we learn to compare games more thoroughly and go beyond fucking well, ahem, it's actually an Arkham game, nothing special besides Nemesis system, if we ever want game reviews to be taken seriously. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. If you feel offended, go ahead and leave an angry comment letting me know how wrong I am, so I can get even more engagement from you. I'm not a saint by any means and I've been guilty of the same in my reviews, but we can all strive to be a little better, can't we? But yeah, reviewers were right on that one. The gameplay does feel like Arkham Knight with that dedicated parry button and cool combos, combined with pretty much every unlockable skill being let's kill everyone, but stylishly. And it's a solid formula that always works. What's better than kicking ass with style? Oh, I know what, getting XP for each cool action. Whoever thought it was a good idea to have those XP prompts for each kill was absolutely right. This is a good idea. The gameplay is versatile as hell. Using stealth mechanics, you sneak around and stab orcs to death. And if you feel like it, you can go full Sam Fisher mode on most locals. Uh, looking for me? Or if you aren't a little bitch helping the imperialistic government, you'll have cool looking combos, executions, upgrades and so many other ways of killing orcs and uruks as you face them head on that you will have fun throughout the entire game. And to me the most shining addition is a bow. Oh my beloved bow, those orcs don't deserve that level of complete and utter violence. Chaining it together with shadow kills, flying from one enemy to another without ever stopping, oh man, I'm getting wet just thinking about it. You will feel like you are a big mean killing machine. To complement all of that you have a nice skill upgrade system and another upgrade system and a system to add runes to your gear. It's like an orgasm board. Smorgasm board of customization options that let you tailor the gameplay to your own playstyle. 
Now, all of that would already be enough for a solid action RPG with an open world and a bunch of different orcs to kill, so you can enjoy the world of Middle-earth Park Ranger in full glory. But Shadow of Mordor decided to dial things up to 11 and threw in a nice little mechanic you probably never heard of. The Nemesis system. This is what gives every single orc you fight a sprinkle of personality, less so with ordinary enemies and much more so with orc bosses. Each and every single one of them has their unique set of traits, abilities, strengths and weaknesses. The system makes each encounter with the orc boss unique, forcing you to use every skill at your disposal. See that orc with a giant shield? You could try to snipe him with an arrow. He's immune to that. Well, okay, let's just hit him. Oh. Not a problem. We will just jump over him like we do with other shielded enemies and hit him from behind. Oh, fuck you! This was one of my first fights with an orc boss in the game and I had to come up with a whole new strategy just to beat him. And that's just so great. It gives your brain a tingle and makes you feel like you figure out a puzzle. But the reward for solving this puzzle is watching someone die horribly, which is even better. This is an amazing system. And each orc is procedurally generated, so while you might never meet Tugok the Guardian, may he rest in pieces, your orcs and your encounters will be just as unique and thrilling. And developers could have just stopped here, but they never did. See that orc army? It's a living and ever-changing group. They duel, raid each other and protect each other from you. This is truly an Uruk dollhouse that continues to generate stories even without your input. But if you decide to go in and rearrange the pieces, orcs won't forget what you did. Got killed by an orc? He will remember it. Manswine! Your strange witchery doesn't matter. I'll just kill you again. Fled from an orc? Oh boy, he will surely mention you being a little bitch. I'll chase you all over Mordor! This is very much an orc build game and Monolith Productions went all in with bringing those creatures to life. I can say with 100% certainty that this is one of the best orc games ever made. It's even better than Orcs Must Die. Let's talk about visuals. This game falls into my favorite type of stylistic traps for AAAs coming out somewhere around 2010 and 2016. They spared no effort in making their worlds look realistic, which was tough to achieve because of the obvious limitations of what was possible back then. I guess at some point AAA companies collectively decided to do two things. Make everything look dark and gritty and add rain to the mix so that everything looks like a slime factory exploded. And I swear to god everything looks as wet and glossy as my hands when I was young and found out what I could do with them and my, <laughs> let's just say, my elf root. But despite my favorite dark and sloppy filter everyone was using back in those days, the game looks dope. Art direction is great, you can clearly see everyone in the art department was doing their best. Orcs, who are a centerpiece of this artistic genius, of course are the best looking. But even beyond them, everything, from the environment to useless collectibles, looks organic and makes sense in this world. Like, look at this strange rock, it looks cool, I desperately want to touch it. There are only two distinct regions in the game, but they sure do look different. You can easily tell a lot of effort went into crafting each one. The Blackgate region is influenced by orcs and their inability to build anything decent. Everything is made of wood and metal crudely slapped together and the whole place is very depressing. That really makes you understand Talion's wife, who wanted to get out of there by all means. There must be a better life than this. As for Nurn, the region had been occupied by a more advanced race in the past, so orcs just squatted the old ruins and fortresses. You can see a nice region slowly but surely losing its greenness to the Uruk war machine. And I have to mention water. Of course, it's very realistic. Solid 42 gallons of liquid out of 69 dehydrated towel tablets that you should not consume and see what happens. Great, just great. The game still holds up incredibly well both graphically and artistically. Alright, now let's talk about the story. If you want to avoid main story spoilers, go to here. Ok, little kids just left, let's get into it. Trigger warning, death of relatives. Here's how the game starts. Yep, this game takes a page straight out of every single D&D player made character sheet. The classic trope of having your family killed off so you don't have to interact with them. 
You are Talion, the captain of the Black Gate Watch, a group of rangers who have been tasked with the most straightforward mission there is. Your job is to make sure that orcs don't get into the realm of men, and alert everyone if there's signs of some dark force stealing. A task Talion and his men failed so hard, no one will ever know what went down here. So Lord of the Rings movies can still happen. And we get a clear view of those responsible for the death of your family. Those people are Mordecai their main, average techno rave attendee, and a reaction streamer who is actively dying from underlying health issues he refuses to address. Right after that, you wake up with an elf man inside of you. He tells you that you have been banished from death. Remember that it will be on the test. And so begins your open world adventure to find out who killed you, lift a curse so you can finally die and ideally get some sweet revenge in the process. With that brand new elf right inside of you, you will have new abilities to unlock. One of them being the ability to ask orcs politely me for intel. We now have a name Black Hand of Sauron, burning hatred for orcs and a strong dominating elf inside of us, fueling our desire to kill. As the first lead in fighting the Black Hand that's rogue Sauron, we have an orc named Gimop the Slayer. It's mentioned his slave managed to put up a fight against the Black Trio. That slave, of course, turns out to be our old friend who ditched the watch for some inexplicable reason. As it turns out, the reason is a beautiful local woman. Good job brother, smash those cheeks. Another mission involves Redback the Coward. He is the lowliest and weakest of all orc captains. We, naturally, strike a deal with the orc to help him move up in the ranks of Sauron's army in exchange for all the help he can provide. Actually, give me a second, I fucking hate spiders. That should do it. We start by helping Redback kill his first orc enemy and scoring him a promotion. I guess it's more plausible for him to kill someone twice his size than for us to be involved in it. Orcs are strong, but they are not smart, so I will suspend my disbelief here. Oh, and Gollum is here. He wants to show us his trinket, specifically to our elf friend. At this point the story splits into three distinct parts. I will go through each one separately, and we will see how they all come together again. So the Gollum story is all about him showing you random trinkets he stumbled upon. You touch them and have a vision into the life and suffering of an elf you willingly let inside of you. The visions are all very cryptic and it looks like elf killed his family or something. The visions are intentionally murky. First you get a vision of the elf family being dead in the background with a bloody hammer in the foreground. Then you see a vision where Sauron gifts a hammer to this unknown elf. So the only logical conclusion here is that this elf is a policeman. Because who else would abuse his family like that if not a member of the force? Hashtag ACAP. But this elf is not just a random blacksmith, oh no 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 no, this one is named Celebrimbor, the guy who made the rings of power. In the game's lore, Sauron is just a CEO, forcing someone else to create the product so he can swoop in and claim all the credit later. After each vision, you are granted a new power that Celebrimbor now remembers having. But for now, let's put a journey down the memory lane on hold and go have fun with the outcasts. And their story continues a lifelong tradition of having wife gone, sad, story beats in games we are reviewing. Most of it centers around the struggles of the outcasts, which, very conveniently for the reader, revolve around looking for his captured wife. And until Talion helps him find his wife and completes other errands, he won't aid in tracking down the Black Hand of Black Lord of Black Orcs. Oh hey look, first mission and we already found his wife. No idea why she's green too, but I won't blame anyone who likes green woman. Been there, done that. Other outcasts missions have you finding card full of grog. A drink orcs enjoy and which is conveniently also highly flammable and highly explosive. No idea how that's going to help us with the black hand of black market, but I guess we'll see later. Right now, to make that highly secret plan work, we need to weaken Sauron's grip on the region. Let's check on our buddy Redbug. And he's doing very well. A smart guy. He even got himself. <laughs> I'm kidding, he's one step away from becoming orc stew, so we will have to step in and save him. After you kill every orc in the area and their boss with a strangely irrelevant nickname The Twin, Redbug is now promoted to a bodyguard of a warchief, the highest ranking orc in the army. He will infiltrate and overtake warchief's castle and help us with everything we need. Well, I don't think infiltration is going according to plan. Hey, Redbug, what happened? The pain of my twin shall echo within you. Ah, so that's why he was called The Twin. Yeah, that explains it. Oh well, let's just kill him too. After another notch to a kill count, Redback officially becomes a war chief. I will be honest, I like him. He's a perfect caricature of that one idiot in your office who's thick as brick, but knows the guy who's responsible for promotions. So he just keeps falling upwards until he's one of the top dogs. 
art truly imitates life. And now, with all the pieces in place, the only thing left is to kill all the other war chiefs. Pop pop pop, done. So, back to this ingenious plan of finding the hand of the black. All this time, after Talion's death, slaves were forced to erect a great statue, honoring the Dark Lord Sauron. This one. And you know how outcasts plan to find the hand that fits Sauron? Step 1. Blow this shit up. Step 2. See what happens. Step 3. They didn't think that far ahead. Talion protects the card filled with grog and explosive powder. And after you heroically ram it into the gate, the statue collapses. An idiotic plan that would make Demon proud executed flawlessly. The next day outcasts tell you thank you for the fish, but we are leaving. They also heard a member of the Sauron's Black Hand just showed up nearby, so maybe go check him out. Mordecai's remain arrives, totally pissed off about what just happened. So he sends Redback to the Shadow Realm. I'm sorry Redback, you will be missed. But jokes on that guy, because Sonic the Ranger is here and he will spin his enemy to death. Bye bye, you won't be missed. And that wraps up our first chapter. Now all that's left is to kill the other two members of the Jack Black Hand. Oh, hi there, blonde lady who showed up right after the big guy swinging a giant club died. What do you want? My name is Lothario, from the Sea of Nernan. Well, I guess we have to go to Nernan next. Damn, this section is too long. I'm not used to talking about Middle-earth for so long. People usually leave the party at that point. I need a quick break. Here, watch this while I'm gone. Be me, average Ock, enjoying my average day. Drinking grog eating need nothing special. All of a sudden this human rolls up talking about his lost wife or something. Boss is unhappy with him, threatens to kill the guy. Ten seconds later boss's head is going to orbit. Everyone I know dying. Mork, Gork, Urguk, Durdok, the shield guy. All my homies gone in a few seconds. Don't know what this guy's problem is, but I gather all my strength and confront him about it. What is wrong with you human I say? We were just camping and having a good time. Why would you crush our party like that? Gork was about to get married, and you shanked him, and this guy here goes. No hard feelings, fellow orc, but I'm looking for my wife, and you don't look like my wife, so I'm going to- Where were we? Oh, right. Nern. We meet with Letario's mother, and from the looks of her, she's clearly a basement dwelling VTuber. She hits us with a super specific prophecy about some power rising to fight Sauron, and instructs you to retrieve something from Goose and find a dwarf. Lady, this isn't Fort Bayard. How am I supposed to- Well, I guess we will go look for a dwarf. We get the hammer from the ghouls and have a vision with Galadriel. She's well known for being a little useless in adaptations. So she just tells Kelly Brimbor to figure this shit out himself, because the white lady can be buzzed. Suddenly the ghouls surround us, forcing us to flee. Oh, hey, look, a dwarf! And, true to this game's long-standing tradition of folks from different races trying their best to avoid talking to their wives, he is hunting beasts as far from his wife as he can get. The story branches off into multiple side stories for the second time, so let's go over them one by one. After we help the Queen of Nern sip on gamer juice, she tells us about a power that has been hidden inside of us all this time. A power of slavery. This unlocked a domination skill that lets us control any orc we so desire. Well, just ordinary soldiers for now, and we still have a quest to do. While playing with our new powers, we rescue Queen's soldiers, and they give us another artifact, which grant us yet another vision. This time, it's a peek into Celebrimbor getting captured by Sauron and becoming all googly-eyed over the One Ring. I wonder where this is going. A new vision from the Queen arrives in the form of a man using her to Skype call Talion and Celebrimbor. Why have you returned? You are not done yet. He explains that the power that lets them dominate orcs lets them dominate all orcs. Such a great story. I like how both Stallion and Celebrimbor share not just a body but also a single brain cell and neither of them thought about dominating orc bosses. After dominating our first orc boss and finding out that the desire to fight for the Bright Lord is a disease that spreads very easy... Wait, what? Bright Lord? Really? Like Dark Lord but with a different color scheme. Look, the Hitler beat at the start was a joke, you don't need to make it so obvious. Kelly Brimbor, chill out a little. So yeah, we can now dominate orc bosses. And now we have our own personal war chief, just like Redback. Fortunately this one has life expectancy in double digits. Which are still seconds, but at least they are longer than Redback's. Oh, and the queen tries to dominate us, with the power of Saruman. 
Yes, that Saruman. He will not be mentioned again. Hope you enjoyed how much he's involved in all of that. After we break the stuff of white lies, the queen goes back to usual. By usual, I mean she assumes her skincare routine and pays a visit to a good hairdresser to cover grey hairs. But our queen of milfs is still sick, so we need to help Litariel retrieve medicine for her mother. The only notable moment in this sequence is Kelly Brimbor immediately cock-blocking Tarion when he gets funny ideas about strong, powerful woman. I know who she reminds you of Tarion. She is of this world, you are not. Besides that, we help her out as much as we can and it all culminates in her getting captured and almost getting killed, but then we save her. After we pull out a Valiant Rescue, Litariel offers Talion to stick around. But he says, nah, sorry girl, I like you and all, but I'm not a tits guy, nor am I an ass guy. I'm an elf guy. And with that, this side story is over for now, but we are told to go dominate all the war chiefs, so we are ready. Dwarf side stories are all about hunting. Well, that and the short people jokes. I've got a feeling in my gut you may survive this, Captain. Well, since that's the largest part of you, I like those odds. You ride Karagors, learn to dominate Graugs, and finally find the Super Graug the dwarf been hunting this whole time. Why? Because that Graug killed his brother. And then we find another artifact. It gives us another vision. This time it's Celebrimbor carving those fancy letters on the One Ring. Cool, I guess. Oh, and we help Torvin, the dwarf, kill the legendary Graug. That's it, we won't hear from him again. Goodbye, my vertically challenged comic relief friend. Now let's get to dominating Uruk Warchiefs. Mwah, 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 mwah. Done. And finally, we are going into the end game. That thing we were preparing for was a nice trip to the land even more wild than Mordor. Berlin, Germany. Here we will find the second member of the White Glove Society. After we say goodbye to Northern citizens, we embark on our adventure to the next region. Burn. Maim. Kill them all! Yeah, just as I imagined being welcomed to a German rave party. Where's the host? Oh, there he is. So, remember when I said like 10 minutes ago, remember that it will burn the test. When Kelly Brimbor said you were banished from this, he fucking lied. He chose you as his vessel slash host, which is why you can die. He could kill you anytime. Girls, if he wanted to, he would. Anyways, no time for arguing, it's time to dance. After experiencing a few hallucinations from those strange mushrooms you got from an alarmingly friendly guy, we kill another member of the slightly dark toned head. Right after that, we witness the funniest family argument where Kelly Brimbor goes light stallion into fighting the final member of the cult that loves black. You said we were cursed. You deceived me. It was Sauron's doing. This was your doing! I should have died with my family. I thought you wanted revenge. I can't leave you. But there is only one way to close the circle. The Black Hand remains. Not for long. I will be honest with you boys and girls, I'm starting to think that Kelly Brimbor is not a nice guy. Using orcs as slaves is one thing, but using a white man as his pawn, this is way over the top. We are in the end game now and there is only one mission left, but before we get there, we have another vision. It shows Kelly Brimbor stealing the ring from Sauron and running away with it. As I said, at this point there is no doubt about the fact that he's just another elf hitler. And this vision pretty much proves it. It's not like he destroyed the one ring, now did he? Also Golem is here and after he tries to kill us, Mountain Doom finally wakes up. And Talion has to head back to Mordor, storm the Black Gate, ironic, and face off against Sauron solo. That's a bold strategy to be honest, but I got to give him props for it. After we take out the last 5 Orc War Chiefs, we meet with the Dark Elf that was doing the ritual. And he's the last of the Blackus Handus gang. He gives us a final vision of Kelly Brimbor's life. He lost a ring like a loser and had his family smissed to death by Sauron. Glad to see that while Kelly Brimbor is an elf Hitler, he at least doesn't beat his wife. It's not really a redeeming quality, but I'm glad domestic abuse is not on the list of his achievements. And after that vision, Kelly Brimbor is violently extracted from Tyrion's body, leaving him to die, and Sauron closes in on him. But what are we going to do? A quick time event is the answer to all our prayers. And in the stupidest final cutscene, Talion, a man whose only focus and desire was to return to his wife, cast light Scaly Brimbor into remaining to fight Sauron. Could you really rest for all of eternity 
knowing that you had the chance to stop him, but did nothing. I guess Talian is a good man, so I will give him the benefit of the doubt, and assume that in the next game he won't end up as some twisted evil echo of his former self. Oh, and they say it's time to forge a new ring of power. So, what can I say about the overall story of the game? If I'm being honest, it's decent. There's nothing fancy besides one or two cool plot twists, but it does feel like an amusement park where you see all the funny things you might remember about Middle-earth. Elves, orcs, dwarves, golem, and a sexy ranger that makes you question your own sexuality. They are all here. The only thing missing are probably the hobbits and Shilop, but at least we will get an abundance of her in the next game. If you are coming here for the story or an interesting expansion of the universe, I wouldn't recommend it. However, if you just want a little nice backdrop while you are killing metric tons of orcs, then it's all good. You will be pleased. Unless you are that weird middle-earth purist who reads the Cinema Smith Valerian, but there is no way you would still be watching this video. And now let's see what DLCs we have on the story page. Those are useless cash grabs, those are useless skins, and those are the things that should have been included in the base game and don't deserve their price tag, even if it's cheap. If you have two spare dollars laying around, give it to your local hobo, they will provide you with more interesting stories than any of those DLCs. In fact, there are only two actual DLCs available, Bright Lord and Lord of the Hunt, and we will talk about them next. The Lord of the Hunt DLC kicks off with you totally transforming to impress your dwarf side chick. This DLC is very much a you wanted more of the game, so here is more of the game experience. There are no big stakes here, no urgency or anything, it's just you, your dwarf friend and an insane amount of short people jokes at Torvin's expense. You meet one new version of each beast you faced in the main game, fight, kill and ride each one of them, as well as finally figure out how to dominate the ghouls. The DLC ends after you kill 5 war chiefs. And Torvin, who already said before he's leaving, leaves once again, this time for good. But thanks to you, he now has less hatred in his heart for ghouls, who he previously hated for some reason. The DLC doesn't add anything to the game or the overarching story, but it's there for people who felt like the main game wasn't long enough. Do get it if you can grab it on sale and have an insanely high need to play just a little more of the game, or get a lot of new material for you to use on your short friends. Otherwise, skip it. In essence, it's just 3 hours of very, very mediocre missions. The Bright Lord DLC has spoilers to the main story, so if you prefer to avoid them, skip again to here. This DLC, unlike the Lord of the Hunt, actually adds some stuff to the story. As you could have guessed from the name, we are playing as Skelly Brimbor this time, and we start right after that vision where he steals the ring from Sauron, and he immediately uses it for cool finishers. <coughs> Just like the Lord of the Hunt, this is a very short DLC that expands on Celebrimbor's story. You will still be hunting, dominating and enslaving orcs. But this time, instead of Talion talking to Celebrimbor, you will have a perfect encapsulation of a voice chat between two people from the far ends of the political spectrum. Return to me what is mine, betrayer. I taught you everything. Without me, you are nothing. The ring will never serve you. Every moment you resist, your family will suffer. Silence, deceiver. I forged the rings. I perfected the one. You will bow before me. Also, if you still had any doubts about Kelly Brimbor being a bad guy, this DLC makes it abundantly clear he is not a good guy. After dominating all five war chiefs, you will finally come face to face with Sauron himself in all his glory and have a real fight with him. This fight differs from the one in the main story where Sauron got defeated by the quick time events power. A long and hard battle follows, and the story ends with Kelly Brimbor dying and Sauron getting his ring back. I'm sorry, little one, it was destined from the start. So, is the game good? Yes, it's a very good game. Would I recommend playing it? Uh, it's complicated. If you asked me in 2014 when it came out, I would have screamed at you non-stop until you played it. But now we have Shadow of War, and the game's most important features, the nemesis system and combat mechanics have been taken to the next level. But if you are feeling nostalgic and want to see where the story of Talion and his elf Hitler friend started, you should totally give it a go. And it's still pretty cheap for an old game. Thank god this pile of shit named Warner Bros hasn't yet noticed they can squeeze a little more money out of players. I give Shadow of Mordor 8 orcs getting their fair minimum wage of nothing at all out of one more idiot calling it a Batman clone. If you like this video, consider subscribing. I don't promise the next video will be as long, but hey, it's about how I use that link, not about how long it is. That's it for the video, bye.
So, originally I was planning to do a review of Shadow of War, but since this game is twice the size of the first one, I thought I should relax a little and review Shadow of Mordor first. That was a brilliantly calculated plan considering this review's length. The next game will be a much, much smaller one. Maybe even two small games, we'll see about it. I regret the decisions that led me to this point, but rest assured, Shadow of Mordor review is still coming. Eventually. Probably. I hope so. By the way, this game has an autofollow feature for the escort missions. You just get close to the NPC and you both start working at the same speed. It's funny how the system seems like a lost technology for many AAA games released almost 10 years later. So lost in fact that Shadow of War, a sequel to this exact game, doesn't have it. I didn't mention collectibles in the main video, but boy do I hate those things. They are never worth collecting and Shadow of Mordor is no different. The mechanic is straight up dog shit. You get a bunch of lore dumps that don't mean anything, because it's not hard to immerse yourself in the world anyway. And I feel like they are there only because someone wanted to add them. After all, that's what other AAAs do, so we should do it too. Which is kinda evident in the lack of effort put into those things in the DLCs. Or maybe they were under serious time constraints. Answer inconclusive. All in all, I hate those things. If you ever wondered why I don't talk about collectibles, this is your answer. It's because I hate them. Galadriel is an absolutely useless character in this game. She's only mentioned twice and both times she tells someone else to figure stuff out. I bet if she lived today she would be a CEO. I also like Kelly Brimbor because he's unhinged as fuck, just clearly unapologetically evil guy. He tries to hide his true nature, but then you get to the end of the DLC and get treated to this banger line. Finally, all will fear me and rejoice. It's so great, I love my evil elf edgelord. And now let's tease another game. 